Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overhaul Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2 and in this video I am proceeding with my attempts to make a hypersonic liner uh, so we are looking for a plane that can pass Mach 5 and can carry passengers and can also cross the Atlantic so it's not your normal Mach 5 plane right we have to carry enough fuel to get across the Atlantic so it has to have range and it also has to carry passengers now, one of the flaws of the Concorde was that one reason why it wasn't very efficient wasn't just that it was going fast and guzzled a lot of fuel. Actually, its engines were reasonably efficient. It's just that they didn't have enough passengers. It was a fairly large airliner. It carried about 140 passengers at maximum, though usually uh, it was configured to carry less. But normally it was mostly empty. Uh, there just weren't, th there wasn't that much demand. And so what you would want for this kind of thing is something that can carry very few passengers efficiently and you know maybe around 20 so I'm thinking around 20 here and so we've got these crew cabins each of which can carry four and we've got five of them so around this might be the sweet spot for those who really need to get across the Atlantic quickly or you know go from place to place quickly uh, in other developments, uh, NASA is working on quieter supersonic technology, uh, so worth a mention that that's happening. Also, there are companies that are trying to make airliners that are Mach 2 and a smaller scale than the Concorde, uh, so that is going on. This is not like some sort of pie-in-the-sky sort of attempt here. This is a thing that people are working on. And I'll, I'll probably gather some more data on that for you in subsequent videos. Now, this is the Peregrine system, and we will see many iterations of this in this video because I've already done a lot of testing and tried it out. And we'll fly each one quickly and uh, show you, you know, what the flaws are. I have not been able to break Mach 5, and I'll discuss uh, the configurations and what I think is the obstacle here. The main obstacle is I started off with perhaps not the best body arrangement. This is a good lifting body thing. Lifting bodies are good for space planes. It might be that this is just uh, has too much drag for a hypersonic airliner. Possibly a Concorde like setup, you know, pointy, might be better for that kind of thing because it just hits less of the atmosphere, right? It's more streamlined and. Uh, the less drag that you produce, the better off you are. And sure, this provides lift, but lift and drag are sort of related, and the less drag you produce, the better. So I think that that's part of the problem here. Uh, but then we get into, you know, we, we don't have uh, the greatest arrangement of crew cabins. So anyway, I'll, I'll talk about that, but let's just go and fly this. But let me tell you about the engines first so that you know what we're doing here. Uh, the, we've got jet engines close into the body and these are uh, used by the F-15, F-16, so F-100 Pratt Whitney engines. And uh, you can see the thrust. Mainly I picked these because they're relatively light compared to the thrust they give and so their thrust to weight ratio is very high. Um, out here we've got ramjets, but these ramjets do not produce any power, any thrust, um, when it's below Mach 2. So you really need to be going fast for those to work at all. So that's our our issue. Anyway, uh, let's take this outside and fly. Okay, so here we are and we are fully fueled so it's as heavy as it can be, 42 tons here and I think it's got two hours of fuel if using just the turbofans. So yeah uh, but that's not enough, uh, well, it, unless we can get to Mach 3, that wouldn't be enough to cross the Atlantic. If uh, we could get to Mach 3, then uh, about two, two and a half hours worth of fuel should be good enough. Alright, throttle up, SAS, we don't use SAS because we're using this, this is basically our SAS, it's just a little bit better at it. Alright, ignition. <laughs> So after this, because I actually know what will happen, I've made a few different designs and I just wanted to review them with you so you know what I had done, uh, so you can make better suggestions. I, I will look for suggestions. Um, okay, let's start rotating. Actually, I should have rotated earlier, but anyway, easily off the runway with its full load. 
gear up. Okay, so right around 7 to 9 kilometers is where we want to break the sound barrier if we can. The reason for this is below this the drag is very intense. And with Ferrum Aerospace that's serious. The, the transonic drag is just prohibitive at very low levels, unlike in stock. Oh, but we don't want to start going down. Higher levels, the air is too thin. You really want a lot of air going through the intakes so that the jet engines can work properly and that's better at higher speeds. So you want to speed up where there's enough air but also where there's very little drag. And this happens to be the sweet spot for most supersonic things. At least the things that are carrying a lot of load. One configuration I didn't actually try but might be worthwhile is just having four of these. Uh, people have mentioned scramjets, but I don't have a scramjet configured, so once again, that's an engine that I will have to add. So, I'm unfortunately, both with ramjets and scramjets, because they're sort of like military technology, you know, they're used in military applications, there's not as much data about them as with the stuff that has been used for more civilian things. We don't really have a civilian application of ramjets. Well, I mean, as you can see, it's proving very difficult to pass that Mach 1.3. But, to avoid belaboring the point, and of course, uh, having the half the fuel load would help at this point, but now we're going down and our efficiency is going down because we are going lower. Let's ignite the ramjet. And you can see, despite the nice flame, we've got a thrust of 12 kilonewtons and a specific impulse uh, about an eighth of the specific impulse of the turbofans. So that's not good. Now, the faster we go, the better off that'll be. But I, I'm, I think it's more efficient uh, the more air is going through, which means in a thicker part of the atmosphere, it's not like the turbofans as far as the efficiency, and so trying to find a balance between the two is tough. And uh, fortunately, the stage time isn't correct. It's assuming that we're getting all our thrust from the ramjet, and that's why it's got that stage time. Um, thankfully, we're getting most of our thrust from the more efficient turbofans, so we've got more stage time than is being indicated, but still, it's a little bit harsh. It does not suggest that we can get across the Atlantic using the ramjets. Pretty clear that it's not going to be easy to accelerate at this level. I'm going to go up uh, more severely and show you what happens. As we go up, the thrust of course goes down, the efficiency of the turbofan goes up, and of course the drag goes down. I mean when I say efficiency it's not just a specific impulse. But the drag we're facing goes down and so that helps. So you'll notice as we go up, I'll try and actually keep the same Mach number might be a good way to go. But steadily the ramjet thrust is going down because we are in thinner atmosphere and less air is actually going through. So we can try the converse strategy, which is to actually dive. Now you see efficiency and thrust going up, of course, as we go faster and more air is fed into the engine. But eventually that's going to be counteracted by the drag and we can have the full flight data. You can see the drag is a uh, whopping 100 and well, 200 kilonewtons right there. Well, you sum up the, <laughs> the what you call it, uh, thrust being applied, the drag is very quickly going to supersede that. And so here our ramjet is delivering twice as much thrust as it was at the higher level. But we're facing much more by way of opposition. So if we level out, you can see that we're decelerating now. And we 
we are decelerating right now because the drag is greater than the thrust being applied. Before we were diving and we were sort of getting a benefit from the gravity. But we can't maintain this velocity in level flight. We will end up in level flight at about Mach 1.3 again. So basically in this configuration with the full fuel load or close to it, this plane cannot pass Mach 1.3, Mach 1.4 in level flight. So let's try and dump some fuel at the start and see what happens. Okay so this time we're roughly half fueled and we will see how we do. And uh, in other flights we're going to change up the engines is what's going to happen. So ignition. We may also uh, go with 16 passengers, passengers instead of 20. Uh, we're getting close to the edge. Okay, good. Another consideration is since we're lifting off fairly easily from the runway, we might want to reduce the size of the wing. Because the wing produces drag as well. A more streamlined wing would be good. Not having these outrigger sort of engine pods might be a good idea. I mean, the tucked in engine is much better than having these out here causing drag. Might be worth a test to see with the lower load whether we can break the sound barrier down here and get the ramjets fed. And again, really breaking the sound barrier means getting past Mach 1.3. I mean, Mach 1 is the sound barrier, but then you still, you're still facing a lot of drag from uh, the transonic drag that, that you need to overcome. Okay, well, let's try and ignite the ramjets right now. Right now producing 15 kilonewtons. And we're still accelerating, so that's good. And going up. Accelerating and going up is golden. But maybe we, sh maybe we should flatten out to really try this. And I guess I should show you what happens to the drag as we go up. So you can see we're diving and we really can't keep up with the rate at which drag is increasing. So we're not gonna go any faster. Let's go up where it's a little bit thinner. And what I want you to see is how quickly the drag drops off. And again, it's measured in kilonewtons, so it's very easy to tell whether the drag is overcoming your engines or not. So up here at six, 7 kilometers, we're basically facing half the drag. But now the ramjets are not producing as much thrust, though, you know, the difference between 11.4 and 15 is not much. This is not what we want out of our ramjets. Now that brings up a question, well why ramjets when the specific impulse is so low? It's because the jet engines are not going to function at extremely high Mach number. The way jet engines are designed, they don't work past like Mach 4 or Mach 4.5, even with the SR-71 engines. You can't push them beyond Mach 4.5 or they'll overheat. So we need something, if we want to go uh, really fast, we need something that can withstand that heat. And one candidate is uh, Ramjet. Obviously another candidate is a rocket engine. But we know how those guzzle feel. Okay, now the drag seems to be going down slower than the turbofan and Ramjet. So let's see. So here we have uh, pretty close to like 60 kilonewtons. So we got 120 kilonewtons of thrust. And we can see that the drag is approaching 120 kilonewtons. And right when we get to a uh, drag equal to the thrust that we're producing, we'll stop accelerating. Unfortunately, uh, pressure and drag, uh, they increase by the square of the velocity. So every little bit of velocity 
leads to a very big increase in drag. They drop off based on atmospheric pressure. So then here's the conundrum. You could dive and get the benefit of gravity to help you accelerate, but then the drag is going to start increasing. You can try and go up, and that will reduce the drag, but it will also reduce the thrust available. Lift. Well, lift is fairly simple. Uh, if you want to stay level like this, more or less, uh, your lift had better be your mass times gravity. So that's the force pushing up on you, that's your lift, and then the force pulling down on you is gravity, and gravity is your mass times gravitational acceleration, so the lift had better be your mass times gravitational acceleration if you want to stay level. If you want to go up, obviously that should be higher than that, as it is right now, that's why we're going up. Air requirement met is interesting. I don't know, maybe we need bigger intakes for the ramjets, but these are fairly efficient intakes. So I don't know. One possibility, one possible solution for the low thrust we're getting from these is just to have a awesomely huge intake for each of these ramjets. But then you're going to have drag, right? So, but I don't like the air requirement met 2.3%. I don't know if that's true or not. It's tough to say. And now you'll see here on the ramjet, it says prop requirement met 0%. And then for the turbofan, prop requirement met 100%. I don't know what to make of that. Maybe it's because we're just not going fast enough for these to work. Speaking of which, uh, maybe it's a good time to do a dive because we're not going anywhere. So let me just do a steep dive and try and break Mach 2. And maybe we'll get some thrust out of those guys. Estimated endurance is nice, and range. If you really want to plan an Atla transatlantic trip, those will be helpful. And you can see that the estimated endurance is better than the stage time that MechJet provides. Well, we're really not. Even in a dive, we really couldn't get very fast. Alright, let's try something different. Okay, well this is a modest change, and the change is getting rid of one of the crew cabins, so now we only carry 16. And I won't belabor the point, uh, we will try and get up to speed, and I'll show you how fast we're going in level flight at around 7 to 9 kilometers, and um, we'll test it as that. I mean, at least that's a good benchmark. We can see that we're going about Mach 1.3 uh, with the first flight, and then the second flight probably like Mach 1.4, maximum Mach 1.5 in the dive. So we're not really getting that much traction. We'll see how this does in this way. But note that it's lighter. Also, we on, only have half a fuel load, so half fuel load and also one less crew cabin. Okay. Okay, we are past Mach 1.3 with just the turbojets. Let's... Well, let's see what we can do with the ramjets on now. Well, we're at 1.464 on the level here, but we're facing high dynamic pressure, which means high, high drag, so let's go up a bit. But I, I'm gonna try and not go below Mach 1.4 while going up. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any luck up here either. You can see the interesting numbers here. Drag 40 kilonewtons. We're down to Mach 1.2 here. That 40 kilonewtons is hanging on steady here as we're sort of stratospheric and in the stratosphere there's a point where density increases. That's the ozone layer and stuff like that. Um, so you can actually see as we go up, even though we're going slower, the drag is increasing. And that's because of uh, that change in the atmosphere right there. And so unfortunately that uh, creates a bit of a headwind. And with that 40 to 48 kilonewtons, our current, uh, call it 38 kilonewtons, really can't keep up. Nope, I mean the drag is definitely, I mean we're going slower now. 
And our control surfaces are relatively stable. And still the drag is going up. So let's just... I think we should abandon this attempt. We got to about 1.5 to 1.6 on the mark number. But I don't think we're going to get much better. And so we move on to Peregrine 3. And this time we have instead of the F100 engines, we have the J58s from the SR71. So much more powerful engines, and I put them outboard instead of putting the ramjets outboard. No particular reason for that, I think. It's just that, you know, the SR71 had the engines with the shock cone intakes, and so I just wanted it that way. Uh, so the ramjets are in here now, and the downside, of course, of these engines is that they're heavier. And we'll have to see how that goes. I think I also shortened the wing on this particular version. But still, I think perhaps a thinner body might be another way to go as far as optimizing it. But let's see how this works. And this time we're going with a full load of fuel because uh, the SR-71 engines aren't quite... Well, they're gas guzzling, so we're going to need the extra fuel, I think. Let's see. Throttle up, and ignition. As you can see, its initial stage time is 48 minutes. Not great at this point. The SR-71 engines are sort of partial ramjets themselves, so... One other possibility is that it's completely redundant to have the ramjets there. But the SR-71 engines aren't like Mach 5 plus kind of ramjets, at least I don't think so. It certainly doesn't indicate that in the description in the VAB for these engines. But here we face the problem of efficiency, and these engines are not so good within the lower parts of the atmosphere, so we really need to go up. Uh, we are not going to... well, I don't know. We're, we're already past Mach 1. Let's go ahead and light the ramjets and just see how fast we can go, huh? Maybe... let's try it down here and see how fast we can go. We could take off again later. Needless to say that the SR-71s are doing a much better job feeding... feeding those ramjets as well. And let's take a look at the ramjet stats. For the first time we're seeing numbers above 30 kilonewtons take a look at also the drag though. Let's get all the information up for you. Look at the 300 kilonewtons being put out by the SR-71 engines right now. But the ram... see this ramjet is lagging behind quite a lot. We're past Mach 2. We are uh... We're at high dynamic pressure and we really need to go up, otherwise this thing will eventually blow up. So, let's uh, nudge that up a bit. But the estimated range though, there we have a bit of a problem. Despite our low velocity with the other one, our estimated range was like 2,000 to 2,800 kilometers. Still not good enough to cross the Atlantic though. Now, yeah, we're going to Mach 4 very easily here. The ramjet is reducing its thrust, though. Look at that. So, we can't go this high and still get performance out of the ramjet. Do we need the ramjet, though? Well, can we get above Mach 5? That's another s separate sort of question. I don't know about the negative estimated range there. That's not good. We're really close to Mach 5, but uh, Mach 4.7. I should point out, though, those are the SR-71 engines, and you can see they are overheating. So we are going to experience problems if this continues. Now, I think it's very balanced right now. If you take a look at our thrust versus the drag, I don't think we're going to get any faster, really. Uh, the range is getting good though. Going to almost 3,000 there. We would like to see something more like 4,800. So we're still a long ways off from what we want. 
as we go higher the range is getting much better and that's well the thing is fuel consumption is related to your thrust here the thrust is going down but the drag is also going down so it's a balance of those two I mean lower down we were going with uh, 300 kilonewtons on the J58s so of course our fuel consumption was high now we've got a tenth of that thrust fuel consumption is a lot lower but we're still um, maintaining high velocity because there's less drag oh and uh, this version does still only have the four cabins though we did start with a full fuel load interestingly uh, you'll note that to get up to speed because we were at that high thrust we took about half of our fuel load, almost half of our fuel load just covering the first 600 kilometers but now we have 3880 kilometers of range with the remaining fuel so you have to figure that the way to optimize these things is to reduce how much fuel you need just on getting up to speed that's the main thing which suggests that maybe you want your hypersonic plane to be carried by some sort of subsonic plane which gets it up to a high altitude to start off with that's one way of approaching it that way the hypersonic plane doesn't have to carry the subsonic engines with it but you can't really do ramjets like that because the subsonic plane is still a subsonic plane efficient but it can't feed the ramjets we're still decreasing in speed even though we're going down I don't think uh, at these altitudes we can sustain more than Mach 3 really so let's go down a bit but our range is gonna be hurt tremendously by that now one other plus side to uh, going to lower altitudes is that we won't have to have the high angle of attack having to keep your nose up like that in order to stay level means that you're increasing your drag because you've got the more of a surface area hitting the airflow so here the ramjets are doing pretty well look at that 140 kilonewtons now they're surpassing the J58s but the effect of that is because they're still remarkably inefficient with a specific impulse of 1460 our range has completely collapsed but here let's see if we can get past Mach 5 that would be a good thing before our fuel runs out which is in about six minutes but it seems like a hard limit of about Mach 4.8 and we've already gotten to the point where we've lost more than half of our fuel so dumping fuel on takeoff is not going to help now the Mach number is not an indication of our real speed you know I mean the reason the Mach number goes up sometimes when the real speed is going down is because Mach is dependent on atmospheric density whereas the real speed is not. On the other hand, we are trying to develop a hypersonic plane, and the definition of hypersonic plane is Mach 5 and above. So, since that's what we're going for, we're looking at that rather than the absolute velocity. In any case, our range has not really gotten to where we need it to be, though at the higher altitudes, it's closer, but it doesn't look like we can do better than Mach 3 up there okay so we face the question do we really need the ramjets with the SR-71 engines basically very close to ramjets maybe it'll be better off not having the ramjets and having the greater range and maybe not going Mach 5 well let's take a look at what the Peregrine looks like in that situation Okay, so here we have the situation with the ramjets removed and also the ramjet intakes, well, the intakes that we had up there that were feeding the ramjets removed and a fuel, full fuel load again. So, let's see how this does. By the way, I think, uh, well, we have, for two people we have five days of food, water, and oxygen. So we have 
plenty of supplies for a transatlantic flight for the the crew as well as the 16 passengers in case you were wondering all right so there we go and throttle up and well let's uh keep an eye on those let's keep that up ignition and breaks off Bit of a bounce. Okay, gear up. Now again, so far we've been using what might be considered outdated engines. After all, these SR-71 engines, uh, they're, uh, wow, what is it, 40-50 years? Let me double check that, but even the F-15, F-16 engines aren't exactly new. So, gotta take that into account when it comes to these things. The SR-71 was introduced in 1966, so that's 50 years now. Well, clearly at, uh, if you just want to keep Mach 2, this thing can definitely make it across the Atlantic. Well, we are creeping up to Mach 3. Eventually, we would probably hit it. And we would still have about 6,000 kilometers of range two hours estimated endurance well let's see Let, let's just keep it right here and see how well we can do on the Mach number as it's steadily climbing and our range will this do better than the Concorde with the SR-71 engines well it had better the Concorde was built to carry you know maybe four times this many people this uh, and it had twice the engine power but only twice the engine power so right now this isn't doing so well and we haven't gotten to the speeds that the Concorde was the Concorde with the SR-71 engines was able to sustain alright we are at Mach 3.82 we've covered some distance so the fact that the range is below 6,000 kilometers now makes sense uh, basically we have kept up the same range and we still have 1.4 hours left of endurance here. Uh, this stage time says an hour and 40 minutes. I might need to reconsider even looking at these numbers, uh, especially considering the Concorde flight, with, where I was trying to plan, plan based on these numbers, and that was not such a good idea. So I think this could make it across the Atlantic. Uh, I mean, think we've covered about 700 kilometers right there. We've got 5,700 kilometers of range. Maybe. I don't think I have enough time to keep trying this out. It's sort of a duplicate of the Concorde mission. We're going at about the same speed. And I think we're just going to stay at this speed for the trip. Uh, why, why don't we try and descend, even though it'll reduce our estimated range, to see if we can go faster. Let's see what the maximum speed of this is with just the SR-71 engines. And to do that, uh, going lower would probably be better. We'll go to the cruising altitude for the SR-71. That's about, 20, uh, about 18 to 20 kilometers. Okay, I think uh, we're looking at Mach 4.4, maybe Mach 4.5, but I'll have trouble getting to that at uh, 20 kilometer altitude. But unfortunately, our range is way down to 2,500 kilometers. So that's the trade off. Alright, I think we know the dynamics of this particular vehicle, but it's not getting us to where we want to go as far as speed. Range, we can do. Speed, not so much. Alright, well, there's one more Peregrine design, Peregrine 4, that we would like to consider. And that is, what happens if we are using the Rolls-Royce Rolls Nygma Olympus 593s from the Concorde on this? They are more efficient than the SR-71 engines, but less, less powerful because they don't have that ramjet sort of quality. So the question is, what will it do, given everything else is the same as what we just saw? 
So it's just a curiosity sort of thing before we redesign this. Next time, our, our next attempt at a hypersonic plane will have a more streamlined body. And we will compare that to this in terms of performance. And that will give us some interesting data to work with. So anyway, here we go. So I'm actually a little bit surprised by uh, the specific impulse and fuel consumption right now. It might be that the numbers aren't perfectly correct for uh, these engines. And that's entirely possible since I was the one who added these engines to the game. It might be worth reassessing the mass of the crew cabins. There, uh, it might be because there's heat shielding on these, because they are space plane crew cabins and cockpit. Because we're basically half the mass of the Concorde and we've got half the thrust with two of the engines and we're not going to get too far past Mach 2, even in level flight. And yet we're carrying only 16 passengers versus the Concorde's capacity, so maybe these should be able to either fit more passengers, like two abreast, or, right now they're just one abreast, right? Of course, it is a luxury liner, but still, we're comparing against the Concorde's capacity. Or they need to be lighter, so I'll have to think about that. It might be better just not to use these and reserve them for space planes and find some other way of uh, carrying passengers. But yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually surprised by how low the performance is right now. We're at 18 kilometers and the estimated range is only 3,000 kilometers here. 1.6 hours and Mach 1.88. I mean, I guess we could go higher, but we're not going to be going any faster as we do. And as we go higher, we might increase our range, but our speed is going to suffer. And the game here is to go fast and efficiently. Yep, so this is somewhat of a surprise. Now, with these engines and that, and the Concorde, that performed as I would expect the Concorde to perform, and I've flown it in a couple of flight simulators. Not in real life, obviously, uh, but uh, a couple of flight simulators, and it seemed to work the same way, more or less. And but this, the gap in performance between this and the SR seventy ones in terms of efficiency is sort of surprising here. Anyway, so uh, this is where I'm at. We haven't uh, got a hypersonic transatlantic passenger liner yet, but we're working on it. So on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.